delighted that uh, Professor Sarwar Kashmiri, who is identified in your uh, journal as uh, a, uh, a writer, uh, an educator, a current affairs commentator, and strategic communications advisor. But what was omitted is that he is an eminent public intellectual. Uh, his book on NATO and transatlantic relations is a classic. And I predict his most recent book, uh, China's Grand Strategy, Weaving a, a New Silk Road to Global Primacy, um, will be a bestseller, uh, which will be good for the Foreign Policy Association since it comes out uh, under the imprint of the Foreign Policy Association Centennial Books. So I urge you all to buy a copy of the book. Uh, and uh, we're delighted that uh, Pamela Kyle uh, Crossley, um, a, an eminent um, scholar at Dartmouth College, uh, can engage in this conversation with Mr. Kashmiri. Uh, I turn the floor over to you. Only one correction to Mr. Latif's speech. With all due respect, feel free to buy two or three copies each of the book. <laughs> Before I start, uh, this book, uh, it has, amongst other things, almost the first list of projects of the Belt and Road Initiative of China. And believe it or not, a junior from Lebanon High School helped pull this together from a large database. So Logan, where are you? Can I see you? Please stand up. I'd like to recognize Mr. Logan. Logan Palzerano from Lebanon High School, who has done the entire appendix in this book. Thank you very much. Uh, so, Pamela, what I'm going to do is something that I decided not to do, which is uh, read a paragraph from my book. Because I'd like to just begin uh, all of you should have a map of the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, do you? Yes. Yes. Okay. And so what I want to do is start off by just explaining what this beast is, and then we can open it up to uh, the inquisition that Pamela, one of the world's foremost experts on the Qing Empire and thinks China, uh, will, will ask me. So this sets the stage for what I firmly believe in. In the space of two generations, China has transformed itself from one of the poorest countries on earth to one of the richest. During this process, China has benefited more of its people faster than any country in recorded history. At this rate of growth, within another two generations, China, with its mix of hard-nosed communism, and raw capitalism is destined to become the most powerful and influential country in the world. But another prize of even greater significance is heading China's way. People may begin seeing autocracies as more attractive and beneficial to its citizens than democracies and may believe that a democratic liberal world order is not necessarily the best form of government. So that just gives you an idea of uh, where, uh, where this book uh, takes, uh, takes, uh, uh, takes this argument. Uh, and, uh, and we can go on in that respect, but I just wanted you to at least get a feeling for uh, where, how, I, how I approach the book. Right, so Pamela, with that, let me uh, turn it over to you, and please keep your questions easy. First of all, I want to congratulate you on uh, writing a compact book that nevertheless has a sort of amazing scope. It is um, almost a unique resource, and I really congratulate Logan on contributing to um, so, some, of, some of those features. Um, 
I think in your books you're always you're challenging, right? You, you there's some kind of of uh, conventional wisdom, whether it's about NATO or it's about China or about BRI, that um, you you are coming along to really challenge people. And I think in this case, the challenge, particularly to American readers, is very very distinct. Um, the, at some places, you lay out your precepts, right, of what uh, American policy might be based on. And uh, I think I agree with them, but I do just want to say that in terms of an historical perspective here, this idea of China being on an unstoppable trajectory, right, um, when you historicize it, it becomes maybe a little more complicated in the sense that I think the way people look at it now is in the past, uh, in this period before say 1850 and 1983, which is where I would cut it off, um, China's uh, normal economic role in the world had been um, suppressed um, by what probably, you know, these topical factors. One is um, extraordinary violence um, uh, due to the rise of Japan, and another are the policies of the CCP. Uh, and that once these had both been mitigated in the 1980s, what you see is China returning to its normal position in the world, which is a position of dominance. That's, there's no question of that. I mean, historically, we can see China occupying 25% of global GDP, for the past 2,000 years, um, and um, uh, but at the same time, while it's economically dominant, China was the government of China was not taking steps in the early modern period that would have led to the kind of leadership that you associate with Europe and so on. So, China returning to its historical role as economically dominant, that I think is a foregone conclusion. I'm wondering to what extent you see that as a general background feeding into your specific precepts. For instance, that BRI will succeed, that it will um, have these particular dynamics of putting China in a decision-making position that will actually outflank that of the United States. So the specifics is, is what I'm asking about. The general trajectory, I think this is unproblematic, but the specifics relating to BRI. This is still not, now it's working, sorry. Uh, so I was asked the same question yesterday and, and what I said was uh, that the Belt and, the question yesterday was very specific. Can the Belt and Road Initiative ever succeed, right? And so the Belt and Road Initiative is uh, this trillion dollar project that China has started to connect itself to now almost 100 countries, right? And the idea being to build their ports and, and airports and connectivity and fiber optic and, uh, and so on. Now, it was announced in 2013 in, in Kazakhstan. Uh, and as of last year, China's trade with these countries, the Belt and Road countries, uh, had exceeded $5 trillion already. Uh, and it continues, it continues to grow. So the idea, will BRI succeed, is moot at this point. It has already succeeded and will continue to succeed, right? I, uh, Pamela, always think of this Belt and Road Initiative uh, the, uh, in terms of the moonshot that President Kennedy proposed. Uh, more so, I believe, than the Marshall Plan because uh, I remember I was in aerospace engineering school when Mr. Kennedy uh, uh, said that American will land in the moon in a decade. And all of us who are studying the technology said, how in the world is it possible? Because there isn't the technology, there isn't the systems, there isn't navigation, we don't even have materials that will withstand the reentry process. How can it ever succeed? Mr. Kennedy, I believe now, uh, if, uh, the Soviet Union had put the Sput uh, Sputnik into space. There was a man, a Soviet uh, uh, a man who went around, uh, you know, the earth for a couple of times. And America was falling behind. And I believe Mr. Kennedy was laying out a vision, inspiring American people to do what was almost impossible. And in the same way, when people question the BRI and say, well, where's the plan? How many projects are in it? It's a mistake because I think President Xi Jinping was laying out a vision saying, look, we are now just about the richest country in the world. 
We've made sure that our borders are inviolable, right? Many of you may know, and if you don't, if in times of conflict, an American aircraft carrier group approaches within 1,000 miles of China, chances are it will be sunk, right? So, so China has become the richest country in the world, taken care of its borders, and now it intends to become the uh, most influential, most connected country. And there's nothing unusual about this, right? You go to the 16th century and you have the Dutch doing the same thing. The Dutch uh, uh, money was the trading currency of the world. And then it was the Brits, it's the, the, uh, the pound sterling and the United States since the Second World War. So as China becomes the richest country in the world, the most technologically, not the most, but the, one of the two technologically advanced countries with the greatest population, largest population in the world, it just stands to reason that it will become also the most influential and the uh, uh, best connected country in the world. So that's kind of how I look at it. And I tie it together in my book uh, uh, by saying that the grand strategy of China was executed in three steps. The first step was to get rich. The second step was to make its borders inviolable, as they had been for the last hundred years when it was colonized. And thirdly, to become the most influential country in the world with the Belt and Road Initiative. That's how I put it together. And it's my story and I'm sticking to it. Um, I like that you, that you bring in the, the Dutch. Um, that was the great era of mercantilism, um, which, in fact, uh, the Chinese Empire did not participate in at the time. But it looks like we're really looking here at some kind of a neo-mercantilism, right? That this is basically a statist project. Um, in fact, it's probably more statist than mercantilism even was. And so I want to look at the two sides of this as you're addressing uh, American uh, companies in particular. That is, on the one hand, they shall participate. They should participate because it's going to succeed. And this is the way to succeed, to get with the program, as it were. Um, on the other hand, um, this is kind of asking American companies to participate in a project that is designed to strengthen uh, the government of China and um, enrich and uh, um, stabilize the economic base of uh, the CCP caste, which is basically what this is in China today. So, um, and in fact, I think that one of the, the impetus, one of the I, impetus, impeti, what, I don't know what the plural of that is, what, of, of, uh, of this um, uh, was the fact that, um, yes, investment opportunities in China have become very cramped. It's time to look somewhere else. So development, infrastructure, uh, globally sort of oriented, this looks like a very good way, again, of stabilizing the, the uh, economic foundation of the CCP caste. So looking at these two sides of it, right? Um, uh, we don't, uh, you, I, I mean, I'm not seeing evidence of an American BRI as a possibility. I don't think you're really advocating competition on that kind of a, a level. On the other hand, for people who are really trying to make this decision, right? Uh, well, do I, do I follow the short term most profitable route um, knowing that I'm participating in a project that is specifically designed to uh, serve the interests of the, pres the present um, uh, dominant political cl class in China. So how does that work? So two points. Thank you. That's an excellent question. The first point is that one of the reasons I wanted to write this book, and by the way, it's written not just for experts, for everyone, right? And the big reason is that China intends intends to put in, jumpstart its project with a trillion dollars. That's what they're putting into it. Uh, the World Bank, the Asian Infrastructure, uh, the, uh, the Asian Aid Bank, both estimate that it will take about $13 trillion to complete this project. So where does the gap come from? And it comes from private enterprise, from the large banks, from the large consulting companies. So there isn't a major bank today, Citibank, Deutsche Bank, uh, you name it, ING, that isn't beginning to participate in the Belt and Road Initiative by helping to finance it. And so one reason I wanted to write this book is because I don't want, as an American, I don't want American companies to lose out on this. Right, so that's, that's one reason. And secondly, there's a lot of talk about containment of China. I think that bears into what you said. Uh, we're going to contain China. 
Well, I think first of all, it's impossible. How can you contain a country that is the, about to be the richest country in the world, is already the largest aviation market, the cell phone market, the luxury goods market. Half of Italy's luxury good manufacturing process is dependent on sales in China, right? So you can't contain it. And again, historically, as countries have become rich, this is what happens. You can't contain it until the graph starts to, uh, uh, to go down. So how do we work with it? And my point, uh, Pamela, is that the, uh, that the biggest issue in the 21st century is how do America and China coexist? I mean, America isn't going anywhere, as all of you will agree, right? We're the huge, rich country, capital markets, technology, universities. So how do these two countries coexist in a world where America is not the number one all around the world. Right. It's China that will be preeminent in Asia. So, so I think that ties into uh, 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 what, you, what you were asking, I think. Yes, I, I mean, I'm wondering if, if really when you... May I make one more point? Sorry, because you, um, are, you have statist. Yes, yes you may. Statist, yes. yes. So there's also a lot of talk about, uh, uh, besides containment of China, uh, the idea of defending uh, against a major competitor. Well, I don't like defense. I like offense, right? The moonshot was government money put in, large amounts of U.S. government money put in, but it, it helped America lead the technology, uh, lead with the leading technology in the world. Right? People were using this non-stick frying pan. Well, that came out of the ablative material that was developed from the nose cone of the re-entry vehicle. So what I would like to see, even if it's statist, is I would like to see a major project of the kind of the moonshot that invests in chips and semiconductors and all of these technologies that will drive the 21st century. I don't want China to be the leader in that, but I don't believe we can stop them by saying, oh, we'll have tariffs or we'll close American companies to it. Let's give him hell by a fence. Oh, okay. Um, uh, Did I throw you off balance on that one? No, um, except in this, in this sort of model of contestation, right? It's like we're talking about entity A and entity B. And so we're acting as if we're comparing apples and apples and oranges. But I wonder if we're comparing apples to oranges. In other words, if things go the way that you're suggesting, in 10 years, let's say, if a person is asked to describe uh, the Chinese presence um, in the global economy, it isn't going to have boundaries to it, right? It's not going to be Asia. It's, 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 it's going to go through all these sort of filiations of the, of the BRI. On the other hand, if they're asked to describe American presence um, in the global economy, it will be found in various kinds of institutions, but it won't have this kind of coordinating center to it. I mean, I personally do not believe that that's possible. I mean, we, we've just had you know, very small demonstrations of it in this country that, that, that it just isn't gonna happen. The White House isn't going to be uh, uh, coordinating all the strategies of the, the major corporations, international corporations that we we may uh, arbitrarily denominate as American, right? So I, I, I'm just wondering, you know, if a person came out to try, it would be impossible to map these things. Uh, but on the other hand, I find you would, I think you would find these two presences operating on rather different planes. And uh, so I'm not really sure how, what, how one would um, predict or even describe a kind of direct conflict between them. Um, but having said that, I want to go on to um, something else I wanted to ask you about, and that's basically ideology, the ideological dimensions of this. Um, I like this space shot thing. Um, as you know, my, my sort of idea was really to compare it to the models coming out of the 50s and the 60s for um, global financial discipline and, and uh, development strategies um, in which the United States, uh, together with uh, some European powers, are basically the kind of hegemonic uh, presences there. Um, I think a lot of the ideas behind BRI are really drawn from those kinds of programs, right? Those development programs of very late 40s, mostly the 50s and so on. But 
the space shot thing, I think it not only comes out of your aeronautic background, I can see this made a very big impression on you, but also this idea of, of a challenge, right? Our team has been challenged. Now we're behind. Now we gotta get ahead. What will we do? Um, a lot of the book, I mean, you have a very, very efficient, effective way of writing, and a lot of the message that comes through is kind of like this. Hey, look, they're getting around you. Look out. You, you, you've got to really pay attention to what is happening. I don't really think a BRI-type response is possible for the United States, but I think you, you, you shift towards the end of the book into something I think is quite important, which is this ideological um, aspect of it. And what struck me is that there's been a flip, a really dramatic, vivid flip in the way that we're understanding stability to work in the world. I think a lot of what was behind uh, American thinking um, before the Cold War, during the Cold War, was the idea that um, stability um, enhances the prospects for democracy and capitalism as two kind of mutually reinforcing uh, developments. So that the more we keep things stable, the better this is gonna develop around the world. It's where there's instability that we're gonna be worrying about uh, infiltration and subversion. Um, now with BRI, and this being under the leadership of President Xi Jinping as it is, um, the way the stability works is quite different. Suddenly, it has nothing to do with democracy. In fact, democracy and stability are now inimical to each other. Um, so uh, this is something I'd like to, to hear more about your, your, your thinking on. You, if I'm understanding you in the book, you are ending on this ideological note. You're talking about the authoritarian challenge that is inherent in BRI and its success. And again, I guess I'm gonna ask, what, what do you want Americans to do about this? Wow. Okay. So, first of all, I think the, a lot of people think about authoritarianism uh, and relate it to the Cold War and the Soviet Union, right? And what I'd like to point out is that, in, that China's approach is very different from the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was bent on expanding its ideology and its power around the world. China, I don't believe, is interested in spreading its ideology around the world. I think China wants to get rich by making other countries rich. Right. Quick personal story, if you will, Pamela. I was in Singapore last year for a month and got a call from uh, Beijing to give a talk. I didn't have a visa, so I rolled into the Chinese embassy and filled out forms and interviews and so on. They called and said, uh, come on in, we have your visa. So I went there and they said, Mr. Kashmiri, it'll be 290 US dollars. And I was born in Bombay in India. And I said, you know, nobody pays anything in Asia without haggling, so why don't I try? <laughs> so, uh, so, so I told this gentleman, I said, look, uh, I'm just a poor professor. Can we do something about this $290? And he looked at me as though I was crazy, and then he held up my American passport, and he said, Kashmiri, this is not about who you are. This is about where you're from. <laughs> Message. And then he smiled and he said, but I tell you what, what if for the same price I give you a 10-year multiple entry visa, would that be a good deal? And I shook his hand and I said, that's the deal. <laughs> so that was the other side of that message, right? And uh, I think, Pamela, that uh, there's a lesson there, that, that, that China is on this money-making, you'll get rich, we'll get rich idea. And I think that's what drives China and what it's trying to do. Right? So how countries develop, that's for people like you, historians, to judge, right? I mean, the First World War, if you stood out on the street in America and said American involvement in this war is nonsense, let's stop. You know what would happen, right? You would uh, be arrested and thrown in jail. If your neighbor in the apartment building said, uh, oh, this Kashmiri fellow, he just thinks this First World War, this, you know, uh, not First World War, but the battle in Europe, uh, we shouldn't, you went to jail. So systems change, and I 
just cannot predict how China will change, right? We do know that two or three administrations have made a mistake by thinking that China will develop like the liberal world order. Well, they haven't. Whether they do remains to be seen. I, I think you want to leave time for questions. Yes. Um, technically, we're all over, already over time, so Adam or Cole, if you could get firm with us about when you want us to stop. Um, so y you will moderate the questions, correct? Uh, right, and if I get into difficulty, I'll call on you. Okay. Shall we open for questions? Please. Just said. Hello, I'm Josita Capriati from the Foreign Policy Association, and I am Italian. My country was the first to sign the BRI agreement with China last April on the occasion of President Xi Jinping's first official visit to Italy. The agreement is initially $5 billion, but Italy in exchange is going to export more goods to China. Right now, this week, a delegation of 50 Italian businessmen are in China to do business. At that time, Italy was criticized by all the other European countries, but guess what? In two months, France joined in for $20 billion, and let's see what happens. The point is BRI, I think, is going to work if it is a two-way operation. If it's only one, like it has happened so far in developing countries, it's not going to work. And so just that is the question that will it work two ways? Is that where you were headed with it? I, th I think you make a really good point. If it's just going to be a one-way street, then it will collapse on its own weight. But the evidence so far is not that, right? The evidence, if you, for example, the, uh, in Greece, the port of Piraeus, right, in Athens, uh, it used to be a decaying port. Uh, after the Chinese leased it for 99 years, today it is the fastest growing port in Europe. And the reason for that is because, some of you may know this, but these big container boats, they carry up to 20,000 containers, 20-foot containers, 20,000 containers. That's how commerce is taking place now. And what the Chinese have done is mastered that technology of docking ships in deep water ports, of large gantry cranes that, cranes that handle six containers at a time so they can be transshipped. So, what the Chinese are doing is making a material difference. I'll give you one other example, which is uh, the city of Duisburg in Germany. Right? This, was a, this is a city on the Rhine with good connections throughout Europe, and it was decaying. Uh, and the Chinese now run 30 trains a week, 30 trains a week from China to Duisburg. So now there are 500 Chinese warehouses there. There are offices there. Uh, the mayor of Duisburg says we are, proudly says we are the first Chinese city in Germany. So I hope this continues because what you say is exactly right. Please. Oops, sorry, it went by you. Uh, the, the, anyone who was uh, at the back there. It's my book. I can write it any way I want. <laughs> no, uh, my, uh, absolutely right. I have a flip answer, but my real answer is there is absolutely no evidence anywhere in any country that China is trying to export its ideology. And I would challenge you to name a country in which China is trying to do that. I don't believe they're interested in it. They uh, claim they have uh, uh, socialism with Chinese characteristics, right? They're developing in that direction. Uh, so perhaps when and if a country wants, uh, when and if we see it trying to export its ideology, I would be convinced otherwise. But I would challenge you to name one country uh, anywhere in the 70 or 80 countries that are now part of the BRI where they're exporting their ideology. I just don't think they're interested in that. There was someone at the back. Yes, I'd like to uh, ask about the BNI initiative in relationship to the 
climate challenges that face the, the uh, planet and wondering whether they might, in this um, initiative, develop some useful um, ways and take a leadership role in, in how we're going to both grow and uh, contain the, the problems of um, industry in, this, in the world. Thank you. I mean, uh, I, mean I, I continue and have believed for a long time that uh, that is one of the most important issues that the world has to grapple with. But the only thing I can tell you is that China today spends more money on sustainable technology and control pollution than all of the countries in the world put together. Right? So this is the way China's approaching it. And, and this isn't something that they're doing because it benefits the world, even though that's some part of it. Uh, but, uh, but, but I think they're doing it because they see the evidence. One can't breathe in Beijing. There are more deaths, you know, in China than in a lot of places. And so they're taking active measures to that. And I don't know how you feel, Pamela, but I think that that's going to make a difference in this whole debate on, on, on climate change and so on, don't you think? Um, I, well, China is famous as a leader in green technology, that's true. They're also, at this point, still the, the largest uh, source of carbon emissions. And, and uh, so, uh, on a per capita basis, really, they're not doing too badly at all, uh, particularly compared to North America, where we have lower overall rate of emissions, but on a per capita basis, you know, we're still um, uh, out of line with, with the rest of the world. Um, I, I, I think uh, there will always be these two things Competing that um, mining in Africa, um, which is you know the great sort of period of developing mines in China, which was so destructive, is is over. But now it's time to do that in Africa under, under Chinese auspices. So I think you know there are waves of this that there there's going to be these tensions, uh, technological responses, remediation, um, uh, particular in China, remediation has been very important. But areas that are on the sort of a frontier, right? of uh, particularly China's uh, search for natural resources, rare earths and so on, where Africa is very important. I think these, these countries are at risk. There was a gentleman at the front table here who was bypassed. May, can we just bring it? Thank you. Um, first, I would disagree with the comment about somebody who complained about World War I because Lindbergh wasn't arrested in World War II for complaining. I think that's misaligning free speech. I think in China we have, I don't know, is it a million Uyghurs in a re-education camp? Um, that's clearly constraining free speech. I think you're right, they're not exporting ideology, but they are exporting money and control. So we see, we have seen in Malaysia that they export money and they get corruption. And what we've seen in Sri Lanka is they get control. And when Sri Lanka couldn't pay back the money for the port development, China took the port. That's, that's kind of striking. Now, you know, I don't know that that will happen in Italy or France, but it might happen in other parts of the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, I guess what I'm saying is these are not friendly people developing in a benign way. So let me, uh, you make, thank you for that question. Because, uh, no, I mean that. Because one of the difficulties in Americans understanding what China is doing is exactly the point you make, which from my research I find to be patently incorrect. The only real example of a debt trap, quote unquote, is in Sri Lanka, the port of Hambantota, right? And a lot of research has since shown that the then prime minister of uh, uh, Sri Lanka was from the province which would benefit most from the money that China was bringing in, right? So, this isn't a, guy, a country that innocently took all this money from China, believing in its good graces. Mm -hmm. This was a very deliberate uh, lawyer who signed. Uh, so if I may just uh, continue for a moment. The original contract, which I have seen uh, on the port in Hambantota, also specified that were China to lease 
this in the future, the price at which it would be leased and the investment that China would have to make to improve the port once it started to lease it and took it over. And in fact, since the time China has taken it over, it has invested $750 million into that port at Hanbin Tota. There was a very nice article op-ed in the Wall Street Journal two weeks ago uh, that pointed out, and their columnist had actually stayed in Sri Lanka. And he said he couldn't understand where Americans, I'm paraphrasing, were getting this idea that China took this over. He said, I'm in my hotel window, I'm looking out, and there is an enormous development coming up with Chinese money. So he, he said that it was patently untrue, the image that has been portrayed of Hanbin Tota. The uh, Center for Strategic and in, uh, International Studies, CSIS in Washington, tracks BRI projects probably better than most, and they say that there's probably one instance that one can look at and say that this was a debt trap and they don't believe that even that is true and that was the point at Hamben Tota. So I don't really know why the State Department or the administration is pushing this out as, as the truth that China lends money to gullible countries. I mean, the idea that countries just sit around and are gullible, uh, you know, is really far-fetched. And it's not true. So I just wanted to give you a very direct response to that, because that's one of the reasons I wrote the book and did some research, is that that debt trap theory doesn't work, is not true, is ineffectual. Please. This will, this will have to be the last question. Uh, Pamela will be here to answer any more. I'm leaving. Okay. So uh, you wanted uh, the United States to do um, a moonshot. And we're uh, currently sort of acting as the world's policemen. We provide the, you know, we keep the sea lanes open. We're spending a lot on military for the benefit of, you know, the rest of the world, while China is investing in infrastructure. If we were to invest in infrastructure, would we have to pull back on uh, the defense spending? And with China, that says that they can't afford to spend on defense, you know, because they can't afford it, but they can afford $13 trillion on infrastructure. Uh, would they then have to step up their defense spending, and would that jeopardize the success of the uh, Belt and Road Initiative? So happy to end with that, that question. Thank you for that. Right, first, so let me uh, uh, say, first of all, that uh, China, I don't believe, is interested in running the world militarily, right? They're interested in making sure their coastline is inviolable. So if you look at their, uh, their installations, their military installations, where, where they've spent their defense monies, which is roughly a third of the United States, you'll find that they've spent it in space weapons, in missiles, in everything, which are all deployed uh, around the east and southern coast of China. They're, and they name some of their best missiles carrier killer missiles. Right? And the idea is that the U.S. projects its power through its 11 nuclear-powered attack groups. And they plan to sink them. And that's where they've spent their money. So I don't believe they're interested in running the world, right? Because I don't think that that's, that's where they're at. Also, as far as uh, peacekeeping, right, today the largest, con uh, the largest contingent of peacekeeping troops comes from China to the U.N., they pay, as you know, uh, UN peacekeeping troops are paid for by the country. So I don't believe uh, that, 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 uh, that, uh, that they will do what the United States has been doing, which is policing the world, quote unquote policing the world. I happen to think that the alliances that China will force through the Belt and Road Initiative will be much longer lasting and more effective than the American set of alliances that have been developed since the Second World War, which are basically military in nature. Right? And I believe that China, through BRI, will, if I may use this phrase, start a process of alliances 2.0. These will be the alliances that will be, that will be more effective in the 21st century than what the United States is doing. And let me just end by saying, I never have understood why this huge military installation, and by the way, I speak a lot at military installations, so 
I'm by no means a person that believes America should not be strong. We should be the, as strong as we possibly can be. But what is there? Why is America so threatened by, let's say, by terrorism? Doesn't China have any idea that there is terrorism around? Why aren't they investing zillions of dollars and setting up bases all around the world? Where is the return on investment on American bases, right? My favorite question I ask at West Point uh, and at other installations is, to cadets that are just coming in, can you name one war that the United States has won since the Second World War besides the Cold War? Right? And that was one without firing a shot. So I think it's time for us to reevaluate what these alliances are all about. What is the 21st century idea of alliances? But we can talk some more about that later. And I feel very strongly about that. You didn't answer the question what the U.S. should do right now. I think what the U.S. should do is find a way to work with China. Right? So if you look at Blackstone, you look at all the asset management, big asset management groups, they've started huge infrastructure funds. Most people don't know that all of Boston's uh, commuter railroad is being manufactured in Springfield, Massachusetts, where there was a, bro a broken down, rusted factory that the Chinese have rebuilt. They hired 200 people. Massachusetts is now exporting rail cars to other cities in America. That's what we should be doing. We should be working with China, find ways, win-win to work with China. So thank you for uh, pushing me to answer that question. We, we, we must end. Uh, so thank you so much for listening. Pamela, thank you.